As has become the tradition, all 10 episodes of the Bears' third season were released at the same time. If you've just finished your binge and came here for answers about the final moments and the review that flashed on the screen specifically, I'll tell you right up front that it was intentionally inconclusive. The highlighted words are a mix of both positive and negative, and they're presented out of context. This is a part of something the show established as soon as he knew a review was coming, with Carmi imagining both praising and damning versions in his head. And you might say, well, actually, he cursed after he saw it, so it must be bad. But to that, I would offer the reminder that we are talking about Carmi Brazado here, which is probably enough, but I'll come back around to what I think is going on in his head a little later anyway. I'm making this about eight hours after watching the whole season in one go. So there's a possibility the showrunners and cast might come out to explain their motivations for ending it like this in the next few days. Regardless, based on what's on the screen and how it's presented, the point of this scene is to make you wonder what the review might say rather than giving you clues so that you can put it together before the next season gets here. No amount of freeze framing will help you solve the puzzle because you can't even say for sure if he opened the article or if the words they show exist in it rather than being figments of his anxiety-soaked imagination. If that's not enough, the to-be-continued card should do it. And I suppose that's the other thing I should get to up front. Is that even an ending? Is season 3 even complete? And if so, did one of the best shows of recent memory just deliver its worst season, meaning the whole thing is ruined? I imagine mileage will vary on the first of those points. But for the second, no way. After spending more than a month doing a close rewatch and breaking down every episode of The Bear, I can see an argument for this not reaching the heights of the previous installments. Part of what made those first two seasons so great was the intentionality and the payoffs. In the early episodes, season three seemed to be following that same pattern. It introduced a bunch of different story threads that my previous viewing experience told me I should pay attention to, expecting them to be resolved by the finale. When it turned out that they weren't, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't unsatisfying, if not disappointing. Another part of the show's success is its potential to summon emotion or floor you with it at just about any time. And that can make for an exhilarating but also exhausting watch. Season 1 took us through the grinder of working in the Beef's chaotic kitchen in the wake of Mikey's death. But it delivered an uplifting ending through his final act. Season 2 ended in disaster for Carmi, but balanced that out by having several other characters experience tremendous growth along the way that contributed to the restaurant finding success in its first night, even in his absence. There's tension and tragedy, but also release. Season 3 didn't just end on a single cliffhanger about what the review will say and how that'll affect the bear's future. It left all the big questions it encouraged us to think about unanswered. When I finished, I felt sure that this would lead to some backlash online, and maybe even some poster coining the term filler season. But here's the thing, burritos. Not resolving these things was a choice, and season three and four were written and filmed back to back, while the bear has done something that almost felt impossible in the current era by releasing a new season every year. This one is different, but all of what made the show great is still there. The payoffs are delayed, but for me, it's earned the benefit of the doubt, and I'm willing to wait to see what they have in store. Call it a part one if you have to, but maybe don't pass judgment until you see how it plays out. Now let's talk about what happened in the finale and what it means for the future of the series. Going into the finale, a lot is up in the air. Uncle Jimmy has confessed to Carm that he'll have to close the restaurant if they get a bad review, which may not be the worst of it based on the conversation he has right after that with his numbers guy, the computer. He's taking a hit in the market, and the new character urges him to give Carmi a deadline to turn things around, and if it doesn't work out, just to promise to make things up to him down the line. Sydney has avoided signing the partnership agreement that would make her a part owner of the bear on paper for most of the season. She has what's arguably a better job offer from Chef Adam, the former CDC from ever, who has found himself free to open a new place because Chef Andrea Terry has decided to go out on top and close her restaurant. This sets the stage for Ever's funeral dinner, which is sort of the opposite of last season's friends and family at the Bear, which is where most of the finale takes place. Carmi spends the whole season in a hell he created for himself through his list of non-negotiables, 
and the idea of creating a new menu every day to push himself creatively. This causes him to ignore the budget and Sid's input in this thing they're supposed to be building together. A thing he said he wouldn't be able to do without her, all in service of not confronting the things that are truly bothering him. He's also bombarded with memories and images of negative reviews and haunted by what happened with Claire. Haunting is also a fact family thing that gets introduced when a new fact brother, Sammy, who's played by John Cena, shows up to get the restaurant ready for a photo shoot. It basically consists of the haunter doing a bunch of weird things to make the hauntee feel uncomfortable. This family tradition leads our original facts, who provide most of this season's comedic moments, to make the connection that Claire is doing the thing. She's haunting Carmi. He argues she wouldn't do that because that would be chaos and she's peace, but then realizes they're right, but still never works up the nerve to call her and apologize. The facts take it upon themselves to try to intervene at the hospital where she works, but Claire has to chase them away after thanking them for trying while reminding them that she hasn't heard a word from Carmi since the walk-in incident. The problems pile up for Carmi throughout the third season, and his pursuit of perfection through his food as a place he can go doesn't feel like a sustainable solution. Even if he can distract himself, he's driving away everyone around him in the process. If the review is good, it'll just feel like what was supposed to happen and justify all the unhealthy choices along the way. And if it's bad, it will crush him and reinforce his belief that he doesn't deserve happiness. He literally can't advance and learn to find peace, especially not with Claire, without addressing his past, which is why season 3 takes us there so often. Very early in the premiere, we see a flashback to when he first arrived in New York to stage at Chef Danielle Balud's real-life restaurant, Danielle. This appears to be a positive experience that is immediately contrasted by the first of many flashbacks involving the abusive chef David, who first appeared in the show way back in the second episode. After he slams his dish for having way too many components, we see where Carmi picked up his habit of cutting tape off of the dispenser with scissors, and the suggestion to subtract, which he writes out and sticks on Carm's station as a constant reminder. As far as his dishes go, this is probably sound advice, but also one that's wreaked havoc on his personal life and mental health, which is something that will come back up when they meet again in the present during Ever's final meal. Before we get there, the finale opens with another flashback of the fond memory variety, from Carmi's time at the three Michelin star French Laundry in California. It's real-life chef Thomas Keller thoughtfully teaches him how to truss a chicken when Carm has to prepare the family meal on his first day working there, something he'll have Sydney do on her first day at the beef. He also imparts some wisdom he picked up from his first mentor that the reason cooks cook is to nurture people. He emphasizes this part of the profession and brings up the idea of legacy and trying to come in every day trying to do just a little better. This and Chef Terry's final words to the diners during the funeral meal about how their profession is more about the people than the food work together to highlight how everything Carmi's been doing this season has been backward. Instead of following in their footsteps, he's been behaving more like Chef David. And when Carm realizes he's there, he checks out on everything else happening around him. I could try to insert a joke here about him not missing much since I think the conversation at their table is the weakest part of the episode, but I mean I get it. I imagine if you knew who any of these famous chefs were going into the episode, it might be pretty exciting to see them. I had to pause to check the names, which I mostly first encountered when the articles about them flashed on the screen, so it felt a little indulgent. Not because what they say isn't fascinating as it relates to art or practicing your craft at an incredibly high level, but more because these are things the show already did a brilliant job of conveying through Marcus and Luca's conversations in Copenhagen and Richie's conversation with Chef Terry last season. So for me, this was a little much, and even though the season would end on a cliffhanger either way, it felt like it took time away that we could have spent with the characters. The finale does give us plenty of that, though. Unfortunately, we don't get a scene between Richie and Carm where they end the feud they've embroiled themselves in throughout the season. It was a difficult turn of events to watch play out, as was watching Richie walk right past him without saying a word on his way into Ever. 
That added some impact to Luca reaching out to tap him on the shoulder, and it was kind of wild to see Carmi as an active participant in a hug. That feels like a payoff. This episode provides a generous helping of Luca, which includes a funny exchange where he fanboys out on real-world chef Grant Ackett's before the chef eventually just sort of excuses himself. He also has a flirtatious back and forth with Sydney, where she's a lot less awkward than she was whenever Marcus put her on the spot in season two, and where he mentions that he'll be in Chicago for a while. It feels like there could be potential there. At the very least, there's some serious chemistry. And Richie's time in the kitchen with Jess, which he ended up spending the whole night there because he wanted to reunite with her and Garrett, is brimming with potential and chemistry too. Carmi's being stuck this season kept everyone else in the same boat. While we did get a pair of great episodes focused on Tina and Natalie, they were both somewhat disconnected from what's happening in the main story right at this moment. Tina's was about how she ended up at the beef in the first place, and her connection with Mikey. And even though Natalie's involved Donna, which is an important part of Carmi's story, it was more about her fears of being a mom based on her traumatic childhood. Both gave us more insight into the characters, which is always welcome, and Sugars at least offered some hope for the character going forward. Both also deserve their own breakdowns. There's a lot going on and a lot to talk about, but as it stands, they don't really influence the ending much. Richie is the character who suffered the most from Carmi's story not moving forward. He had his Big Forks moment in Season 2, and you wouldn't really have expected him to change everything in his life overnight to become a different person completely, but the transformation made you hope to see big things from him this season. Those never materialized because of what Carm said to him when he was locked in the freezer, which tracks since they're basically family. When you're that close to a person, those things can be hard to let go of, especially when so much history gets in the way. It's frustrating to watch, but I think it makes sense. And for that reason, I think his decision in the finale to reconnect with Chess got him moving in the right direction. He decides to pick her brain and gets advice that lines up with what Chef Terry told her guests. He wasn't exactly floundering at the bear this season, but he didn't achieve anything like the level she operates on it ever. He wants to know her secret, and she says she surrounds herself with people who are better than her, and clarifies that she's not talking about the people she works with. It's another reference to the people you surround yourself with, and it won't be the last one of the night. Carm can't even see the people he's surrounded by because he can't get Chef David out of his head. He eventually takes the opportunity to confront him when it presents itself, which I think makes sense. He's been haunting him the whole season. This is something that has been apparent since we first were introduced to him, but this season really leaned into it. And the small bits of what he picks up from the all-star chef's conversation that's happening around him help him start to recognize how he's starting to treat his staff like David treated him. From our vantage point, not much good can come out of this. You can't get through to this kind of person, and it's not likely he'll ever take responsibility, sincerely apologize, change his behavior, or anything like that. For him, it's more about unloading this thing you've been carrying around. And Karm accomplishes that with a plan that doesn't extend past his opening fuck you. And Chef David responds exactly how you'd expect him to. He even pulls out the Dom Draper when he tells him he doesn't think of him after Carmi says he thinks about him too much. Then he tells him you're welcome. Because in his mind, all the stress and abuse he put on him took him from being an okay chef and made him an excellent one. The panic attacks, the ulcers, and the subsequent intrusive thoughts are a fair exchange for the confidence, leadership, and ability he gave him. As far as he's concerned, it worked. And the price karma's paying now is of little consequence. As mentioned, it's exactly what you'd expect, but there's also a devastating revelation for Carmi that everything he's saying, which sounds so outrageous, is exactly what he's doing in his life presently. Chef David's words are the words Claire heard through the walk-in door, and his kind of focus at the expense of everything else is what has him on the verge of losing a very good partner in Sydney. The good news is that his bringing an end to the conversation by announcing he's finally going to go take his piss and walking away completely unchanged appears to provide a sort of catharsis for Carm. 
His eyes are noticeably misty throughout the scene, and a tear finally falls after he leaves in a way that makes it seem like he was almost holding it back the entire time. He's overwhelmed for a moment, and then he lets out a laugh that appears to signal relief. Will that be followed by change? You'd like to hope so, but he opts not to return to the funeral, so we'll have to wait and see. His last encounter of the evening is with Chef Terry, who at the end asks him to call her Andrea the next time he sees her. He thanks her for teaching him whenever he was there, and she talks about how much she learned, which all boils down to deciding to leave it behind now that she did everything she wanted to do so she can live a life. They discuss how she's at the end of her restaurant journey while he's at the beginning, with the added comedy of him saying that he finally quit smoking and her saying she just picked it up. When he asks what she would tell herself when she was just starting, she says you have no idea what you're doing and therefore you're invincible. So two different encounters with two people who were very influential on his career. And I don't know, if I were him, I would shoot for trying to come out like Chef Terry in the end if I could. If the momentum of Richie's story felt the most affected by Carmi being stuck, it created the most conflict in Sydney's. On the one hand, she's watching the restaurant come together thanks to all the hard work she put into it. But on the other, after friends and family, she's had to sit by idly and watch while her boss and supposed partner changes everything with little consideration for her input. This was a hard season for Sid, with her largest contribution coming as she acted as the mediator while Richie and Carm argued constantly while refusing to talk to each other directly. This is why she hasn't signed the partnership agreement and why she's seriously considering Chef Adam's offer. It's an amazing opportunity that she probably should take. Especially after hearing from the chefs who all worked at Ever and moved on to create places of their own talking about how the greatest mistake someone can make in their industry is working for a bad boss. With Christina Tossi saying that what it unlocks in you is the culture that you choose to create. This is accompanied by Carmi repeating things Chef David said to him in the Bear's Kitchen. And while that indicates he's thinking about this mistake he's actively making, Sid would be continuing the cycle if she stays at the Bear as it is. If she goes with Chef Adam, she'd be able to create her own legacy and create the kitchen environment that they set out to make whenever she first signed on with Carmi. Something that didn't materialize this season regardless of anything else. So much of Sid's story in season 2 was about whether she could trust Carmi. And she's got her answer if she's willing to look at it. The problem is that it's not only about Carmi. Although as illustrated by the flashback in the beautiful premiere, where we got to see her eat the best meal of her life that she told Marcus about, and also see Carm prepare that on the other end, there are things that are hard to let go of outside of the current destructive path she's watching him go down. It's not just that though, and the lively after party scene really drives this home. It's great that she has to be embarrassed that she has Chef Andrea Terry looking through her freezer that only has frozen waffles and pizza inside. Tina, Marcus, Ibrahim, and the Fax all show up and bring a keg for a handful of people. James is blaring on the stereo. Chef Terry is doing shots, putting caviar on egos, and yelling things like service bitches. It's the kind of night you remember forever. And it feels like family. This goes back to her conversation with Luca about having siblings and having someone to go through something with. Walking away from the bear isn't just about walking away from a bad boss. Because in a way, Carmi is more like a brother at this point. This is interesting because the thing about family is that you're stuck with them. You can choose to not have them in your life, but they're still a part of you. The meltdown in the season 2 finale was followed by the promise that Carmi would never leave her alone again. And while you could argue that he did that through his checking out throughout the season, it would still feel like she was abandoning him if she were to take the job. And everyone else for that matter, which is what she starts thinking about when she sees the review for the beef from season 1 on her refrigerator, as they're all having the time of their lives in the other room. She has to go out into the hallway and she breaks down under the stress of making her decision. We saw her struggle with bringing this up to let Carmi know about the opportunity after she met with Adam. It would put him in a tough spot, having to find a new CDC who would be willing to put up with his shit. That probably wouldn't be that difficult given his reputation, but it wouldn't be nothing either. As mentioned, leaving is probably the right choice for her, but based on her quick and somewhat awkward conversation with Adam at the funeral, she hasn't made that decision yet. 
With all the talk about people being the focus and the great time they're having at SIDS, of course Carm is wandering by himself when he gets the alert about the review. He was also missing when Terry took down the every second count sign, which if you watch my season 2 video you know I really enjoyed this detail. Given that that saying is about being present, it makes you want to shake Bear a little bit when you watch him walk down the street by himself. So in the end, Carmi is haunted by his past and can't move forward. He spent this season doing what he knows throwing himself into his passion for making food, which provides him with a distraction from his problems while earning him accolades and recognition from his peers. While it mostly isolates him from the people around him, it has the unintended secondary effect of inspiring those same people. Plus, due to the close working environment and constant teamwork needed to get through each shift, family feelings start to enter the picture, some good and some not so good, which is just like it is. There was some forward movement. Carm confronted a ghost from his past. But the season was more about trying to hold on to something than moving ahead if you really think about it. The plot essentially reflected Carm's internal struggle and advanced at his pace. So even though the finale left us with more questions than answers, the review coming out will provide a release. It's going to force change one way or another. We'll find out what the review says and what decisions Sid makes. We'll see if we get more Luca and perhaps some Jess in Richie's life in about a year. I'm looking forward to it. There's a lot of really great stuff in this season, and I feel pretty confident the next one will be the last. So I can't wait to see what's in store for these characters that I'll surely miss after they're gone. And I think that's a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.